What's good, Dix Nation? Alex Terrace here, a.k.a. the Tratocaster, back again with another Game of the Week preview. This time, we are previewing the New York Knicks facing the Indian Pacers at home at Madison Square Garden at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. You can catch on MSG Network. And with me today to preview this game, we got Mark Schindler. He covers the NBA, WNBA, draft and scouting. He's a writer for the WNBA and Dime Up Rocks. He's a podcaster for Indy Cornrows, Tag the Roll. And you can also find him on the Athletic NBA show Daily Ding. Mark, man, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. I really appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to uh, to dive into this. Except for uh, I know you know coming off last night's loss is probably a little bit difficult, but it's tough. Um, yeah, we got we got some good stuff to dive into today, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. uh, look, it's this is gonna be a fun matchup. I mean, one because it's gonna be the second one of the season. Two, uh, historic rivalry right here between the Pacers and the Knicks, and they're both good teams right now competing uh, for play, for playing playoffs right now. They're on that teetering edge of one another. So this will be a good breakdown. This will be a good breakdown. But before we really get into it, everyone out there, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com. Now let's get into this. All right. Let me just rip the bandaid off, Mark. How do you feel about the Pacers on this season? All right. Because coming into it, I don't know what you expect that. I think everyone was expecting like some full-on rebuild, but they've done more than that. Yeah, I think you you took the words right out of my mouth, man. Like I I expected this year to be um like I I didn't think that they would win 23 games this season potentially. Uh and they're 23 and 18 right now at the halfway point of the year, which a crazy that it's the halfway point of the year, but also that they're already at this point has been pretty remarkable. Um I think especially too over the last couple of weeks, I've really veered over into being a little bit more bought in to what this is. Cause mm -hmm. I think there was a little bit of fool's gold in the first couple of months, not to say that they weren't playing hard and they weren't playing to win, but you know, there, you could, you could poke some holes in their resume, but over the last couple of weeks, they've racked up some really good victories and they're doing things in a way that, um, well, I, I wouldn't be, I would be remiss if I called them a contender. Like that's not going <laughs> to happen this year. They're not that they're quite a ways away from that. But um, I also think you're at the point where you, I mean, they, this feels like a pretty real playoff team, especially with how things are baked into the East. Obviously things can change at the trade deadline, which that's you know part of what's interesting about this team. But um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just solidly a good basketball team this year. And do you think that's more so because of like, the Halliburton experience? Do you think it's Rick Carlisle? Do you think it's all of it? Well, what do you what do you point to the success of the Pacers this season? Uh, it's been a multitude of things. I think a like you mentioned, Rick has been really good in putting guys in the right position. Um, like this is a pretty. Um, it feels weird to call a an above five hundred team a flawed roster, but I do think it is in a sense. Like it's a lot of bigs, it's a lot of guards. There really aren't any wings on the roster. The only wings are like six foot five. So like the, you re you really don't have any guys who are six six to six seven who provides some of that line of versatility, but they play a lot of four guard lineups. They have a ton of, of ball handling, a ton of shooting like this. This team was like one of the worst shooting teams in the league last year. And now they've been one of the best shooting teams in the league this year, even if it's not necessarily held up just by sheer percentage uh, in terms of the versatility that they have, the way they get guarded, it's pretty fantastic. Um, you know, the way that they've played has opened up more for Miles Turner as a roller, which has allowed him to have the best offensive season of his career. And he's been really damn good defensively, too. And like you mentioned, like Tyrese Alberton's made some real strides. He's taking, um, you know, he's finding more ways to attack the interior more consistently to get deeper pickup points. Um, he's found more ways to attack switches with with his ability as a pull up shooter. Um, he's still not like your traditional primary point guard, but I think that's part of what makes him fascinating and, and such a good player. And also too, like Buddy Heald has been really good this year. Mm. Like their synergy is really important. Um, I think that that trio Heald, Turner and Halliburton has been at the center of most of the season. Um, and obviously you've gotten huge, huge out, uh, outpourings of stuff from like both. I mean, both rookies, Andrew Nemhar has been really good and surpassed pretty much any expectation for this season. Benedict Matherin has tailed off after a hot start, but he's still been really productive. Um, there's a lot to like about, you know, what the team has done and put out this year. For sure. For sure. And it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's exactly the same for the Knicks. Like coming into this season, you know, after Julius Randle having a down year, Tom Thibodeau also, just kind of sticking to his guns and not really 
adapting or making the changes that we needed to see last season to make this team a little bit better with the roster that they had, considering that they were in the play-in category last season of the projection before the season started, you know, right now for this team, I, I look at it as somewhat similar to what the Pacers are doing right now, where you have a young roster, right? Even though Julius Randle has been in the league for so long, he's still relatively young as a player and they're playing above, I think right now, somewhat to their expectations. I came in here thinking that this would be a slightly above 500 team, but the way that they're competing and sometimes the nights at how they win games and seeing Brunson as like a clutch shooter down the stretch of games, Randall really having bought into what the Knicks are doing, being more of a team player while still having his offensive output and now playing defense again too. And then you have the resurgence of Grimes and all these other guys as well um, coming up the, coming up the depth chart. It's been quite, I think, a surprise for Knicks fans, especially for myself, I'll say. But getting back to the Pacers, you know, what was your thoughts on that Sabonis trade? Because that's how you got Heal. That's how you got Halliburton. And you also got Tristan Thompson in that deal, too, who's not on the Bruce roster. God, that feels like forever ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that hasn't even been a year ago yet, which is kind of crazy. Um, it feels like way longer because, like you were mentioning, I think um, – at the time, I think I've, and I still now, I think I view it more as uh, saying win-win is probably a little too much, but I think you can understand why both franchises did it. I think especially for the Pacers, like this was a home run and um, what mm -hmm. they needed. They really needed a reset and where they were going. I still, like, I'm interested to see if this hot start has really uh, changed up the front office's mindset because the front office was adamant after they made the Levert and, and Sabonis trades last year that, they were tired of being a tough out in the first round. They really wanted to be, you know, building towards being an actual contender, um, getting back to what they did in 2012 to, to 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, I think that there are ways that they could have continued to do it around Sabonis. But in terms of like the return that they got, it's really hard to look at that and be disappointed, especially considering that, you know, the way that that season ended up going, they ended up getting Benedict Mathurin, who looks like a future um a future all-star potentially, you know, if mm -hmm. things really bank right and he makes some, some, some steady improvements over the next couple of years. Um, there's a lot to be excited about with, with what this group is. And I think that's part of There's, there's always a double-edged sword with, with potential. Like, and I think it's difficult because on one hand, like Tyrese has tons of potential, but he's also playing like an all-star and should be an all-star right now. Yep. Um, but a lot more is going to have to happen around him before we're talking about this team being a contender. So I think, a lot of right steps in the right direction, but I'm interested to see how they continue to handle it. So with that, right? I mean, I started off just saying that this is a team that was expecting to tank, honestly. For like That's what I was expecting. I think people around the league were expecting. Yeah. And now with the way that they're playing, you're not tanking. You're not going to get that you know high-end lottery pick to continue to add to this youthful team that you have. Are, is is Hal Burton then considered the guy? Because if you know, that's why everyone like talks about taking going into the draft. You want to go to high enough pick, go find that guy who can be someone like Giannis, KD, all these other guys, because that's where you can find it in the top of the draft. Are are you is do the Pages consider Hal Burton that type of guy, or is there another strategy that they're thinking of to go get somebody like that to add to him? Yeah, so I think that's going to be a multi-year thing. Um, I think this year was really uh, about finding out whether or not he could be that guy because making that trade was about saying, hey, we love Domas. We know that he's an, an all-star caliber player, but he can't be that guy. Like, he's not that guy who we can, quote-unquote, build a team around and have him be our 1A. Uh, and I still think there are going to be questions about that with Tyrese, but he's really answered a lot of them for me this season. Um and, and, and sh like, again, because he's been the best player, which has been pretty remarkable. Um, so I think the idea is, again, like more so how they can build around that and how they're going mm -hmm. to complement him and not just complement him, but build in secondary stars, bringing guys who aren't just nice pieces on the roster, but like legitimate mm -hmm. ceiling raisers. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I think like to me, that's, you, you've seen a lot of that this year, especially with some of the clutch shot making stuff too. And mm -hmm. Um, just his ability to continue to grow as a scorer. Um, I think that they're definitely on that trajectory right now. Okay. And look, I mean, you have a young guy right now in Halliburton, right? That's, that's playing well. I think you try to see that, right? Like you try to figure that out as a team, as you go, you want to see what he, his ceiling is, try to build the team around him, seeing if he can be that player. And then you try to make that next move down the line. Um, 
So that makes sense. That makes sense. But you talked about like ancillary pieces and that's where kind of Buddy Heald and Miles Turner fall on, right? And, you know, there's a lot of rumors of them being in, being traded to the Los Angeles Lakers and stuff like that. Do you still think that's going to happen? Or do you now think that these guys are part of this core or part of the future? That's a great question because I think that's what we're really going to find out between now and the trade deadline. Um, I believe it was Mark Stein who reported that uh, Miles Turner and the Pacers had been talking about contract negotiations and there hadn't really been any kind of uh, uh, traction with that yet. And not that Miles is uninterested in signing Indiana. It's been further reported that it seems like there is some interest in him resigning in Indiana. Um, I think to me, I just need them to make a decision. Um, and it has to, like, they've dragged this out for, for multiple years, as as anybody who's followed the NBA is aware. Like, he's been on the trade block for what feels like his entire career in Indiana. Yes. So, <laughs> to the um, Knicks, by the way. He always went yeah. to the Knicks. No, was, I mean, he almost went to the Knicks last year. Like, that was, which was wild. And so I think I look at this, and especially, too, like, he had the, he went on the Woj pod and, like, basically talked about getting traded to the Lakers. And, like, very much himself said... You know, I think that they would be wise to trade me by the trade deadline if 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 I'm not if I don't sign the, my contract because they they want to be smart and make sure they get something back for me. Um, and I'm sure things have changed since then. I I can't speak for him. I can't speak for the front office. But um, like with how well he's played, I do think it might be in his best interest to want to resign. I'm interested to see what that means for Indiana because again, I think if you trade Miles this year, uh the bottom would really fall out in my opinion. Like there, mm. Tyrese is still going to be really good. He's going to do a lot of things, but the the drop off from miles to Isaiah Jackson or Jalen Smith playing the five is immense. Um, the defense is like rough. I think it's 18th or 19th right now in the NBA. And that's largely because of how good miles has been. Mm. Like their defense is pretty poor. Um, they really don't have anybody who's capable of like, I mean, Andrew Demar has been solid as a point of attack defender. Aaron Neesmith does some good stuff, but overall, like they're, their defense has been pretty hit or miss. It's a lot of miles do shit and we'll, we'll try and be good behind <laughs> you. Um, and I think if they, like, I mean, you can just see the, the defense totally craters when he's off the court. Um, so I think you would see a lot just missing from that. That would, that would probably translate to a lot more losses. Um, so again, like this next month and figuring out, okay, either you're signing him to a, a long-term extension and you're keeping him here or you're trading him because that's you just have to make that decision as a franchise. So um, I think that's one of the, probably the biggest storyline this team has going over the next month or so. Okay. Okay. And then that's for Turner, but what about healed? Like is healed st sticking or, or was that? See that, see that one's, that one's weird too. So I think a lot of teams could use buddy. Um, mm -hmm. Like he's simultaneously, I think a better player than he gets credit for while also having a lot of warts that can be difficult. Like you have to be really bought into to playing with buddy on your team and be able to cover for some of his deficiencies. But um, on the defensive side, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think he he's competed defensively this year to be sure. I think it's like offensively, like it, you have to bake in that he's going to have nights where he goes three of 11 from deep. Like that's part of being a great shooter is yep. being a guy who's always going to take shots. Like no matter what, I think sometimes it can feel to your offense's detriment, but that's part of part of the game. Um and granted, like he is, he's on the older side. He's 30 already. Uh, I think he still has two more years left on his deal, if I remember correctly. Um, but again, he's a good player. And I think what's tough is like, again, if you, if they trade Buddy, I think that massively impacts the offense because he and Tyrese, obviously, I mean, they played together in Sacramento for Tyrese's mm -hmm. first two years and um, they have really good syner synergy together. Um, they've played really well together. They just have a lot going for, with, with one another. And I think if you trade him, there are still guys on the roster who can replicate some of what he does, but not to the same extent, even close. Um, so again, I think you would see another significant drop off in what the offense is doing. Okay. And now you want, like when I watch it, like when the Knicks played the pace of the last time you see it, I mean, it was Aaron Naismith and Buddy Heal that started, that started rocking, uh, even though Halbert was doing his thing too against the Knicks and really kept him in that game. I mean, it was Randall and, and Naismith going at it. You had, uh, I think it was healed and I think, can't remember if it was RJ or Grimes, or maybe they're just switching back and forth to to defend healed. But you just you just see what those guys offer, especially when you have shooters surrounding Halliburton and allows them to attack the lane too. Mm -hmm. it, it's just that team is you can see how healed 
and even Turner for his paint presence and what he offers of being a stretch five, how they all help this team stay together. Like they're that they're, they're the glue to what makes Halliburton really look like the player that he is. But there's also other guys that look good on the Pacers. You talked about it earlier, Nemhard. You, you got Benedict Matherin. Talk a little bit about those guys because I think Nemhard has been the the shock so far this season for the Pacers as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people have caught on to Benedict and what he's doing. Um, like he's been he's been exciting to watch this year. I think like again his his shot diet is really tough, which is what's contributed to some of his fall off efficiency wise. Um, but he's shown a lot of really exciting stuff as a contact finisher, um, off the dribble shot maker. Um, there's a lot of stuff there to be excited about. I think the defense is still going to be a work in progress for a while. Mm -hmm. um, he's really not a playmaker yet. I think that's stuff that you hope will come in time as he continues to learn how to make reads and the game slows down for him. But it, again, it's hard to to not be impressed with a lot of things that he showed. But Nemhar is like, as somebody who covers the draft and 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 college basketball, like I thought Nemhar was going to be a solid pro. Um, but he's already kind of bucked that trend for me a little bit. And like, I think he's a potential starter in the NBA at some point. Like he's been starting for that. I mean, that goes mm -hmm. like, he's been starting for an above 500 Pacers team and like rightfully, like he's been at times their best perimeter defender. Um, he's a really good secondary playmaker and even primary playmaker. Like he's not perfect because he doesn't have all the scoring gravity to like really completely attack a defense, but he had the game against Golden State where he had 31 and mm -hmm. essentially single-handedly won them the game, which was, that was just an out-of-body experience to watch. The three has really been there for him after not really being a, a super consistent thing for him in college, and it looks replicable. Um, he just does so many things that aren't rookie-like. Like he has a very, like he just has a really good in-between game. Even though he's not a great rim finisher, he's really solid at getting there and getting into the paint and just making things happen. Um, he's a guy I'm really excited about moving forward. Like, again, not somebody who I think is going to be an all-star, but somebody who really has shown a lot of shops to potentially be um, a starting caliber guard in the NBA. Sounds like a Quentin Grimes, man. Honestly, yeah, it it's like very much been like, like a Quentin type thing. Um, especially too, because like Quentin's big question was his shot. Uh, not that there, it should have been, but like, because at Kansas, he shot terribly and i think a lot of that hung over him in draft analysis even though he shot way better at houston so it's yeah. interesting yeah and like i guess the the same thing for grimes like <laughs> or for any of the for any of the pacers fans tuning in um like when you watch quentin grimes he just does things in a second year that you would not even expect and he didn't get as much playing time last season part of that due to injury uh against miami towards the end but watching him and, and starting off the season too you know he had a foot injury that he was he was nursing so we had cam in there for a bit and, and evan fournier but like you watch Grimes and you talk about things that you don't see from like a rookie, like I, the way that he's able to attack the the lane and really get past his defenders and find centers for like these crazy like assists, like these dump offs. It's just it's such a high level for a second year player that like Nemhard, you see him having a long future and you hope, I guess, like, like as the Pacers would or as the fan base, what I should say, that you keep Nebhar for the long time, that's what we feel like for Grimes because you you feel like there's a little bit something more there. Like, is, do you have that same feeling? Because, like, when I watch Grimes, I'm like, okay, he was supposed to come in as a 3 and D guy, already achieved that, and then when you watch him play on a nightly basis, you're like, there's definitely some more there. There's definitely more that he could add to his game, and you see, like, with the slight step backs, the playmaking, and I'm like, there's got to be another level here that – we just haven't seen. Is that the same thing for Nemard? Yeah, I feel the same. And especially too, like I, I wrote about Quentin uh, right when the winning streak was coming to an end uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. And he's just a blast, man. Like, like you mentioned, the, the offense, I think, is the stuff that has been really fun to watch. Like the shooting has been huge from him. And I think like he's been in a little bit of a slump lately, but that's, that's going to turn around, I think. But like you mentioned, the stuff that he's done – in terms of actually being able to attack the lane more this year. Like we saw some of it last year, but I think it's been better this year. Like he's got pretty solid burst and can move, but it's just his handle is pretty average right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that like, if, if he has like even slight improvement with that, then you're talking about, you know, him really getting to unlock more as a secondary playmaker, which again, like you mentioned, we've seen a little bit this year, like the lobs have been really fun. He moves so well without the ball that he's just able to make a little bit extra happen. Um, and like, He's a legitimate all defense guy. I don't know if he's going to end up getting the, the full on nomination this year, just due to time missed um, and how up and down the Knicks have been as a whole. Like, I think that they're starting to even out, but mm -hmm. um, like 
Yeah, I mean, he he's one of the few guys who at the guard spot is going to at least get nomination because of how good he is um, as a defender. And you you just see it for the team as a whole. Like, they can really struggle to get stops on the perimeter sometimes uh, when Grimes isn't out there. And, that, I mean, part of that's been better, too, with having Deuce out on the floor as much as they had, sure. had recently. But early on in the year when when Grimes wasn't playing, like, the defense really struggled. I mean, there oh, yeah. were there were times where they really Don't just... Don't tell me, man. <laughs> everything was just relying on Mitch to get blocks or, or really deter things at the rim. And... Like that can work for a certain stretch, but yeah, especially with as good as Brunson has been offensively, the, the defense has been something else, but yeah, I mean, that's to say like, I, I love Grimes, man. I think he's, he's been, he's been a blast to watch this year. Glad to hear that, uh, that, you know, Pacers fans, Pacers nation, someone from someone, a delegate from the Pacers nation is enjoying what Quentin Grimes is doing because as a Knicks fan, we're loving it too. And, uh, yeah, to your point, I mean, I just had to watch it last night with Evan Fournier, uh, out there at the wing in the fourth quarter and, Oh, it's just not the same, man. It is yeah. just not even close. Not even close. But moving along, you got another guy that you drafted last season who plays at the wing shooting guard. It's Chris Duarte. So what does this mean for him? It's a great question, man. I, I just talked about this on a pod yesterday, and I think he is in a very odd spot. Um, partially because he was he was really solid last year, uh, mm -hmm. especially like he was really hot out the gates. He was averaging close to 20 points per game over the first month or two of the season. And then he he slowed down a little bit and then started to deal with uh, with a foot injury. That's gotten worse this year. Um, like, well, actually, it was a toe injury last year. He tweaked his ankle. Um, I think it was, during, it was either during Summer League or because he only played one game in Summer League. So it might have been, I think it was like during training camp, he tweaked his ankle, training camp or preseason. And then that has bothered him this entire year. He's never really looked right. And even when he's been on court, he hasn't felt like a great fit. Like, hmm. um, a lot of what they're trying to do is kind of playing transition in the half court. So like they, everything is about constant movement and running into things, not, you know, you, there's trying to have as like as minimal amount of ball holding as possible. Like they really want to just move quick. Um, like even with their screens, they really aren't setting screens. It's a lot of, um, running into a pick and roll so that you can, because they don't have guys who are great at setting screens and then rolling. It's either they're setting a screen and then they're popping or they need to roll ASAP. And I think they've really leaned into doing that more with miles this year. Cause they just don't have good screening on the team. Um, so for, for Chris, like he's somebody who very much likes to take one or two seconds, size up, get into his isolation moves, get into his handle, and that doesn't really fit what the team has been doing. So it's felt really awkward at times watching him. And outside of like a four or five minute stretch against Portland uh, recently, he's been pretty much a non-factor for the team. Um, he's had some okay moments defensively. And I think he nor normally at large is a solid defender, but um, it definitely feels like he is kind of the odd man out in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I know some Pacers fans look at it differently, but for me, especially they have they have three first round draft picks in this coming draft. They could obviously end up changing that up and um, maybe acquiring a player or moving up in the draft. But it really seems like he doesn't necessarily fit what the long term future is, um, unless some things really change for him. And again, part of that is health. But um, it's been a tough year for him for sure. Okay, and would you say that for for Duarte do you expect him to be like a starter in this league or do you see him more of like a bench piece and like was do you have any idea like what he expects out of himself yeah I have no idea what he expects out of himself he's a pretty soft-spoken dude like English isn't his first language so when he does talk it's normally a little bit shorter mm -hmm. um but I mean I've never heard anything bad about him I think last year he showed stuff that made me think he could be a starter in the NBA um like there was a reason why Golden State uh, was repeat like I mean that was reported that they were repeatedly calling about trying to acquire Duarte even after they drafted Kaminga and, and Moses mm -hmm. Moody um, because they really wanted Chris Duarte and he's a guy who I think in the right system you can plug and play him and he's he, like he's going to be a fantastic player he he has some secondary playmaking he really thrives um, you know in in some movement sets and getting to attack uh, off second side actions and I think on a place that already has an established star like a Steph Curry or um, you know, even like in Milwaukee, I think Chris would fit really well, like just being able to play off of Giannis and, mm. um, you know, factor in like that. I think that there's a lot of ways where he could fit in. Well, again, though, just for this team and the way that they want to play, it's probably not like it, it. I mean, it could work, especially, you know, maybe, maybe it's more injury related stuff than I'm realizing, but, um, 
I definitely think that he's at, at, at worst, like he's a rotation caliber player on a playoff team. Like he's, he's already shown enough for me with that. If he's able to get back to where he was at before injury. I, I asked this because, um, Sean Devney of heavy.com reported that uh, I'm sure you saw this as well, where uh, there's he reported that the Knicks and the Pacers had a conversation about one Obi Toppin. So, and you just mentioned earlier in the show where that the Pacers are a little sparse sparse on, uh, on their front court. So one, what would you think? Do you think that do you think there's actually any legs to that where the Pacers would want to trade for someone like Obi Toppin? And two, you know, there's always been the thought about Heald and and Turner. Obviously, you you debunked that saying how much, how much, how important they are to that team. What about someone like Duarte for someone like Obi Toppin, considering that both of them are in situations now where they're not getting enough playing time? I asked the starter question because you look at the Knicks bench, they, we need some scoring off there, and he can he can offer some shooting as well as some playmaking as you talked about pages need some uh need some bigs i would hate it i'm a, i'm part of the ob hive but what do you think what are your thoughts about that i would be really interested in ob to the pacers i think that uh it's tough because i i mean what's like they really don't have a four i believe in right now like all their guys who are fours are really more fives um because they never get guarded like their fours like even jalen smith they tried to start him at the four this year and they've ended up moving him to the bench because um a he just hasn't he, he's really struggled his shot hasn't been there he hasn't really made a lot of strides as a defender um so that's been tough for him um but obi like i even like he's he's if I remember correctly, I'm trying to pull up assessment. Right I feel like he shot better this year. At least I'm, if I remember correctly, at least for stretches he has. But he has. even without him shooting, like, yeah, he's shooting 35% this yep. year. Um, he moves so well without the ball, too. Like, mm -hmm. and I think that fits so perfectly what the Pacers like. Oh, and that's part of what's started. difficult. Like Jalen does, and that's this is not just to like shit on Jalen Smith or Isaiah. This is a family Jackson. show, by the way. This is a family show. I'm giving it just, you know. Oh, I am so sorry. It's all I'm good. So it's all sorry. good. I thought uh, I was like, I'll let you I'll let you go with the first one. But I know I know so, we're gonna get some comments. I'm gonna we're gonna get some comments in the chat right uh, not in the chat, but in the in the comments section. Yeah, I'm just giving you I'm just giving you a heads up bad. this time. Um it's all good. But uh <laughs> yeah, with with Jalen and, and Ajax uh and most of the bigs, I mean even Miles isn't great moving without the ball. Like Obi is so good at um like just knowing how to position himself how to attack the glass how to function in an offense without having the ball in his hands and i think too that the pacers could be a with what the roster is i think they'd be able to be more inventive with uh with getting ob touches and getting him involved because that's been a big problem with him on the knicks like um there's been a lot of unwillingness to actually play him with julius randall which i think uh, from just from knowing a lot of people who are Knicks fans? Like that's something that they want to see, and I, it's something I want to see too. As somebody who's and we have, we have got, we have gotten a little bit of that this season, you know, in some spurts. But it's like some of the decisions of like when to utilize it has been a little mm -hmm. questionable. Um, like I mean, you like it didn't happen last night, but earlier in the season, like we saw it against the Bucks. I'm like, the Bucks are not the team where I'd want to go small ball. Uh, we did, we also did it against Memphis where they have Steve, Stephen Adams. I was like, and uh, Triple J. I was like, this is not a team where I want to see small ball. But, you know, like in a game like where the Philadelphia 76ers were without Embiid and guys like that, that made sense. And it worked out. You know, the, the Knicks were able to uh, eke out a win in that one. But, yeah, it's it's been – it's because of his most recent injury, we haven't gotten to see it that much. But uh, he's been shooting well. You know, obviously it's with him playing off ball, as you mentioned. Like him leaking out is like the big thing for him. Um and now that we have a guard that's doing it, it's like we we could get those opportunities. But Randall's been on such a heater recently. Up until last night, he didn't shoot effect uh, efficiently, but he still had an impactful performance against the Bucks. So it's just tough now when you're starting to see Randall get so many walk so many minutes. Where do you fit that into Obi Toppin? Because Randall's having an All Star case uh, this season. It's just there's a lot of questions. Yeah, no, one hundred percent, and. It's yeah, it's just a weird fit, and especially too, because like you mentioned, I mean, I think that's gone undersold this year to a degree. Maybe not for for Knicks fans, but like as much as I can gripe about Julius's defense, like he's really gone back to being a very good offensive player this year. Uh, mm -hmm. And part of that's been like the way that he's changed up his shot diet a little bit. Um, I know he got made fun of a ton for what he did last night. And I think that at some point you do need to stop shooting threes, but compared <laughs> to what past things have been with him, it's been good stuff. Um, so yeah, it's. 
it's a it's a really weird dynamic with the Knicks for me right now. Okay, okay. So I guess I guess the would you what would you expect? Let's just let's just unfold this. What would you expect a trade if the Pacers were to make a trade for Obi Toppin? What would you expect the Pacers to be offering to to do that? Uh that's a great question. Um I mean, I think Chris Duarte would potentially be on the table. Um mm-hmm. there would be some sense to that. Because the thing is the Knicks also had interest. That's why. That's why I think about Chris Duarte as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I could I could definitely see that. Um, I think that they're it's not really perfect for either team. Um, like I I think because even then, like Chris is I like the idea of him to to New York, but I would be interested to see how Chris, I mean, how how Tibbs likes him. Um, but I mean, I think that I mean that's a good starting framework, I think. Okay. Okay. Just to keep that out there, I know there's fans that want to know about the Obi situation since that was reported not too long ago. But moving along, got to ask you about your coach. We touched on him a little bit, Rick Carlisle. Uh, what are your thoughts about him as a head coach for the Pacers, man? Uh, I think he's been really good, man. Like, I've really liked um, what he's done just in general. I think last year there were stretches where I felt – it actually went a little bit under the radar that he was kind of poor early on in the year. Like I thought he really struggled to get the most out of the roster um, early on. And that's part of, I mean, that that team had a lot of dysfunction going on. Um, so I get it to an extent, but this year, I mean, he's, he's coached pretty much a perfect season as far as I'm concerned, like um, in terms of putting guys in the right positions, um, really getting buy-in for, for what roles are. I, I have no complaints about what he's done. Are, are there any, cause like, you know, I, I heard it last night, even though I wasn't on the post game for last night, you know, Tibbs has his things where it comes to like late game adjustments and stuff like that. Um, being strict with his rotations, although he's been a little bit flexible. Some say that it's because, uh, you know, that it's uh, out of desperation and to partially that is true. You know, it was, it was reported that he was on the, like there was, his heat was starting to heat up based on how some of the games, uh, the Knicks will also season, especially against the teams like the Hawks. When you have major leads, uh, Dallas twice, you know, more so the first one than the second one. When you start seeing losses like that, it really questions, do you have buy-in as a coach? Does your coach have buy-in from the players, right? And are they believing what he's trying to, how he's preparing them on a, game, on a game-to-game basis? So for like Rick, what are like some of his flaws that fans like always complain about that they want to see him adapt? Give me some of that. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, I just don't think that there have been a lot of complaints this year. Um, maybe like if if I could pull one, it would probably just be like, he is, I, I, and I think what's been interesting for him this year, is I feel he's actually gotten a little bit less rigid as a coach, which has been important. Um, because last year, even after they made the trade for Tyrese, like early on, they really leaned into the pace and, and playing fast with him. But then you could see like Rick was calling sets all the time um, last year, like telling them to slow down, um, really trying to ad- adjust things on the fly. And I think this year, he's been a lot more willing to be hands off. Um, like mm-hmm. he, the, you've seen more times of him, you know, actually sitting on the bench or letting assistants coach. Um, like you'll see mm-hmm. the assistants come up and, and coach. Like I think Ronald Norris, like the defensive coordinator, and he'll get off the bench and coach the defense. Uh, if they're, you know, in, in front of the bench uh, during wh- whichever half they are. Um, and, and that's something Kay- Kaylin Cooper and I have talked about. Cause we, we feel like we've definitely noticed that this year. I think that there's been a lot more willingness to, um, let players make decisions and and play with a little bit more variety, um, and that's been to 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 Rick, Rick's credit. That's been exactly what this team needs. Um, like that's what they thrive on. That's what they're really good at. That's exactly what Tyrese Halliburton needs to be at his best. Um, I'm interested to see if that continues to hold up. Uh, just because it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks in some ways. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't really have any 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 issues with with how he's done things this year okay i know hearing some of that uh, especially allowing assistant coaches to make decisions uh i know some of the fan base is is getting a little upset here in that because <laughs> tibbs has a little too much of a, a tight grip on on just decision making <laughs> yeah just just a tad bit just a tad bit but to wrap up the the you know the storylines and, and understand what this paces team about before we get into the preview do you think this paces is going to be a buyer or seller by the trade deadline um that's tough i think like i view them as being a 
I think that they're a buyer. Um, but mm. I think what makes it different is that, and I again, like again, that's something that Kate and I were talking about yesterday. I think that this team needs to be looking to make home run moves. Like this is a team that has thrived on, or maybe maybe thrived is a little too much, but like they've largely done their business by going out and making shrewd moves, like guys who are undervalued by teams, or um, like I was like you know going out and making the TJ Warren trade. Um, which was awesome for them, even though, you know, it didn't work out with TJ health wise in the end. Um, he was incredible for them for that one season. Um, you know, like going like the, the Karis Levert trade, like they didn't really have to trade all that much to bring him in and obviously didn't work out, but same thing. Like when they made the trade for, for Demonis Sabonis and Victor Oladipo, like there's a lot of things you can point out that Kevin Pritchard has been fantastic at doing it like that. But again, when you're talking about this team being different, um, if they want to be a title contender, there needs to be more than just like trading for Thad Young at the deadline or, um, you know, even, and this is not to throw shade, but like does trading for John Collins really quote unquote, like move the needle. I know that Jake Fisher from Bleacher Report um, reported interest that the, that the Pacers had been poking around about making a trade for John Collins. And well, I think that's a guy who definitely helps the team and makes them better. Um, I do think I look at this team being much more in the boat of, okay, well, we need to bring in somebody who is an all-star now or can be an all-star in the future. And I'm not sure that um, I'm, I'm just interested to see if they're going to feel the same way. Interesting. You talk about them making like these around the edge, like smart savvy, like buying well on players. It's kind of throwing like Obi Toppin in there. <laughs> it's kinda, yeah, exactly. It's kinda, it's kinda and that's not that, even like a sign of Obi. It's just it's like, not. Yeah, it's just tough because especially like, I mean, this team has operated the same way for almost two decades, um, which is what made last year such a divergence from that in them actually making that move. Um, and that makes it all the more reason why I want to see them actually follow through on that this year, like, and really being aggressive in who they're going to be in two or three years, not just this, this postseason. Um, okay. 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 Well, that's good. That's that's all. As a, as I won't say that's actually good to hear because as a Knicks fan, I don't want to see the pages do well. So yeah, you, 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 I <laughs> hope you understand, enough. Mark. I hope you understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all for competitive basketball. As a Knicks fan, I need to see my team uh, do better than a team that has been, especially during the Reggie Miller years. Man, can't 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 forget those years. Um, yep. but let's get into this preview. All right, let's let's break this game down. So we know all the guys that are coming back into this game. As of right now, RJ is still out with a lacerated finger. He was doubtful for yesterday's game, so he's making progress on his way back. I highly doubt he goes from doubtful to now being active against the Indiana Pacers, so he will not be in this matchup. That's what I'm expecting, just because it's it usually takes time for 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 them to go up the ladder of like doubtful, questionable, and then back in. So we'll see what hap- We'll see what happens there. But we still have most of our stars, which is Randall, IQ, who's now filling in for, for Barrett and pushing uh, Grimes down to the three. You also got Randall, Brunson, Mitch, all those guys. Those are, that's our starting five. Our bench is a little weak. We'll get into the bench in a little bit. Is everyone still healthy for the Pacers right now before we get into this? Everyone's still uh, up and running? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, everybody should be available. I think Aaron Neesmith is traveling with the team and his uh, TBD. He's dealing okay. with a non-COVID illness. And then okay. TJ McConnell injured his shoulder and is still back in Indiana for the game. Okay. Okay. So this is going to be an inter- this will be an interesting matchup. If there's no Neesmith to guard Randall, which was what it was last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and without RJ, RJ is just, he is a pacer killer. Every, I swear to God, every time that the two teams play, RJ has like 30 plus. Yeah, and actually shoots well from three. Like last time, I think it was two seasons ago, when RJ was just breaking everything from outside, and they played the Pacers, and he went like seven and nine or something like that from three, and broke out of his slump. Um, <laughs> yeah, I That's love. Why we're gonna miss RJ, man. That's yeah. why we're missing RJ for this game. But uh, you know, the the marquee matchup for me though in this game is going to be Quentin Grimes versus Tyrese Halliburton, just because Halliburton's that dynamic player. Of all those guys you're focusing in on, Grimes is our best perimeter player, best defender. He, you know, against Toronto, he was guarding everybody. Pascal Siakam, uh, Trent Jr., uh, you name it, OG Ananobi. He was switching on to everybody, 
being a pest. That's just what he does, man. He's just a gritty defender. And with someone like Hal Burton, who's been thriving, he's an all-star offensively. You know, he can attack the paint. He can, he knows how to shoot. He can get to his spots pretty well. I'm looking at Quentin Grimes going to be that guy uh, to stop or not even to stop, but to slow down Tyrese, because if he gets going, that's where I think this Knicks team is going to have a hard time uh, catching up. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I think the way that he plays Tyrese is going to be interesting. Um, Part of what was so fun about this last game, A, it was really close, but also um, you saw the Knicks really opt to try and full court press Tyrese a lot of the game, Mm -hmm. which I loved. Um, Like I, I tweeted about this. I think I actually am interested to see more teams start to try and do that. I think I've seen more of that this year. Like part of what's fun about having a guy like Deuce is even if he struggles in some ways to contribute offensively, like just forcing teams to take an extra five, six seconds off their possession, uh, struggle to get the ball up. And for a team like the Pacers really can struggle at times in the half court. I think they've gotten better um, at finding more ways, more avenues to score in the half court when things bog down. But early on in the year, like when teams were stopping them in transition, they were really struggling to score. Um, I think in some ways the Knicks exposed some of that in, in earlier matchups. So I'm interested again just to see what that looks like because Tyrese is very much a guy who who wants to show improvement from from each game over. Like he played the his first second matchup with the Heat this year. They basically did that. They full court pressed him a lot of the game. Bam Adebayo switched onto him repeatedly, and he just struggled to to make anything happen. The next matchup, he had his career high. So I am excited to see what that looks like against the Knicks because he he certainly has this one circled after how last last game went. Absolutely, and especially with the Wally Zerbiak comments of a big, uh, yeah. big All Star. So I'm like I said on the last show, like I hope Wally just stays home. I hope he's not anywhere <laughs> yeah. in the arena. We don't need uh, Hal Burton to get any like he doesn't need to see Red Man. That, that, that's, that's, that's all I'm asking for, right? Wally, stay home. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you know the thing, and you talk about Hal Burton being like that savant type player, and it was against the Lakers where he finds Neb Hardy like he's breaking it down in sequence, like his whole thought process, right, for that game winning shot. It wasn't that part that hit that game winning three, right? I'm not going crazy over there. Um, yeah, no, you're not going crazy. Okay, okay, okay. So, you know, as he's breaking it down, I, and you talk about his improvement every single game, I'm wondering what he's going to do from last game, how, as you pointed out, to this game. Like, is he going to recognize like the the full court presses on him? Like, how does he adjust to that? Is it making quicker passes, like looking for Buddy Heald and Nebhard just to make sure the ball gets it quicker and just moving with all off the ball even more like these are all things i'm looking for to see how this game is going to unfold but then you got the rest of it so like how are you going to stop julius randall because you know you had naismith that was just a shocking matchup to me because i i mean one it goes to the lack of front court presence that the pacers have but randall like he's been hot he's an all-star this season like i've been voting for him i know fans are starting to vote for him like, how are you going to slow him down? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Especially if if uh, if Neesmith ends up being out, I am not sure how they're going to guard Julius. Because um, like you mentioned, he was really huge in doing that. Like, he's been kind of in a P.J. Tucker mold for them, um, being like their guy who is just total energy. Even though he's a little bit smaller, he's got a really strong frame. He's really good at using it. He's got good length. Um, I am not sure how they're going to guard him. Uh, cause part of what, I mean, what was so effective with miles, like they play miles on Mitch and then they just, he's really good at being able to roam around the basket. Obviously Mitch is going to have his, have his due with putbacks and, and as a role man, but, um, I'm not sure how they're going to opt to defend him because O'Shea Brissett, as much as I like him, uh, he's a really quality rotation player, but, mm-hmm. um, he does not have the strength to play up against Julius Randall. Um, they don't have an awesome an awesome matchup for this at all. So that that could be really tough for them. That's where I'm looking for the Knicks to like find, especially if there's no Neesmith. Like I'm expecting that to be where the Knicks try to expose uh the Pacers' lack of size in the front court. Um but then, you know, you also got Jalen Brunson, uh, who wasn't he got his 30 points in the last game. So I'm wondering how you're gonna guard him too, because if you're if you're down like if you're just down guys, like how do you stop? Like uh, this is where I think like the Knicks are like, if you're losing players, even though we don't have RJ, like how are the paces going to adapt to this? Because he's another guard that, you know, like Hal Burton is savvy. 
he, he understands like how to look for weaknesses. Yeah, um, I think that'll be interesting. I wonder if they try and be really aggressive with him and try and show more two to the ball. Um, like maybe they do more uh, more selective hedging or, or hedging and covering or trapping um, and just trying to be active. Like especially too, because like they've been, they've just felt really willing to play off of weaker players, uh, weaker shooters, um, and look to to hard double guys, which I think we'll see some of that on Randall for sure, um, and I think we'll definitely see that on Jalen because they, I'm sure Nemar is going to try his best, but they're not going to be able to keep him on him the entire game, um, and Jalen is going to get to the paint. So I am interested to see how they try and chalk up coverages to to adjust to that. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting for sure. But let's move along to the other preview of this match. Part of this uh, matchup is the battle of the benches, man. Um, your bench is better than our bench. I'll just say that right now. <laughs> our bench is not scoring at the at the rate that it should be. And it has in years past. Um, it's it's tough, man. And this is where you know Emmanuel quickly has been. Even though he's a starter, I like that Tibbs is now allowing him to still run with that second unit to give him kind of like that guy to being the playmaker, the score being that one, number one option for the bench, because look this for, for the bench McBride, like he's a little too timid when it comes to uh, looking for his shot. Sure. He gets some opportunities for good threes Hartenstein. He's just not being utilized on the Knicks that as he's been uh, for other previous teams, we're not using him like in the short role to find him for to being as a passer. We're not getting him into an offensive rhythm. We're asking him to actually be a defensive stalwart to be that rim protector, which is just not his game whatsoever. You know, and that's where like for, for someone like myself and fans out there, like we're looking for Jericho Sims because that fits what Tom Thibodeau is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then you also have Obi top and he's coming back from injury, you know, so I expect him to be eased into this game. I expect him to give up some threes, get some good looks, uh, hopefully to give Randall a little bit of a rest when need be, because Randall's been really, ramped up in minutes, especially without Obi and what this team's needed to do to other injuries, whether it's losing Brunson for a period of time, RJ, you know, hopefully Obi can give him a rest uh, throughout this game as well. But what are you looking at for this bench, this battle of the benches? Yeah, um, I think what's going to be interesting, A, because I'm not sure who's going to end up starting for the Pacers if Neesmith doesn't play. I'd imagine that they move Jalen Smith back into the starting lineup. Um, but then that makes it interesting because – if I remember correctly, he struggled getting into foul trouble last time they played the Knicks because Julius just, you know, ate him up because he's way too strong. Um, then that means they're going to have to play Isaiah Jackson more, who also struggles with foul trouble against really strong front courts. So um, that could be interesting to see how that plays out. I'm interested to see if Chris Duarte is able to, to really factor into this game and, and maybe find his footing because that could be a big differentiator for them. Um, they'll probably have to stagger their ball handlers a little bit more because obviously, I mean, Nemhard starts with – um with Tyrese and with TJ McConnell out for the foreseeable future those are really the only two point guards on the team so they're going to have to be a little bit more uh careful in how they stagger their guys um there's yeah I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff here and how it's going to play I don't, I don't think that the bench is going to be drastically different but um it's different enough especially if Neesmith is out where um I, I don't know if the advantage is necessarily going to be with them in the same way okay Okay. I mean, this is where, you know, this is where I I expect this game now based on what we're talking about, how we're unfolding, like the bench, like the bench units, I expect a lot of heavy minutes for the starters. And let me know if that's what you think as well for the Pacers, but I, like, I know that's how Tibbs has been doing this. Like we've been watching 30 plus minutes for all of our starters, which is not out of the norm for him as a head coach, but it's really been more so, especially with guys being out. So would you expect Rick Carl to go in that direction, especially if you're missing, missing someone like McConnell? Because he's he's that organizer and that pest defensively. So if he's not there, right, and he always gives us an issue. I, that, that's another guy. Like, there's Knicks killers out there, and Knicks, there's just guys that really irritate <laughs> play, playing against the Knicks, um, and McConnell's like one of those guys. So if you don't have him, what's, uh, what's you know, what is Rick Carl a solution other than playing a start for so many minutes? Yeah, I mean, I think what's difficult is that that is kind of the only solution on what they have. Like, maybe they bump up Duarte's minutes, I would imagine. Um, you know, maybe you see, like, Nemhard's already been playing a lot of minutes, but maybe he plays even more. Um, I mean, you could see them really get aggressive with Tyrese's minutes, but at the same point, too, um, 
Rick's made a really concerted effort to play a pretty deep bench and not go overboard with minutes because he went overboard with minutes a lot last year. Um, and he said it himself at the end of your press conference. Like, I want to be different with that this next year. We're going to play, um, or not end of your press conference. It was the before the year press conference. Um, and just mentioned like, you know, I want to play deeper. I don't want to have guys playing 35 plus minutes a game. I want to have it down to be a little bit more normalized. Um, and so I don't think that's going to change a ton. At least I don't think that it should necessarily. Um, I think it will just come from bumping up more guys in the back end of the rotation. Okay. And with that, let's put a bow on this, on this preview with what do you think the score prediction then is going to be for this game? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I want to say, I think I would go 112, 106 Knicks over Pacers right now, just because mm-hmm. of like, if, if Neesmith doesn't play, I think that there's going to be some real issues for them trying to actually stop New York um, and what they do on the inside. I think it could go either way for sure, but I'm probably leading the Knicks a little bit right here. All right. I'm on a streak right now with people just choosing the Knicks uh, winning games. Let's go. Um, I'm going to go with the Knicks as well, just because I think if you're missing all those guys, it's going to be difficult, especially what I'm looking at Randall. Randall didn't have, like, even though he got his 25, it was on, uh, no, sorry, not 25. What was it? Uh, let me pull up the the right box score from last night. Even though Randall shot poorly last night, I think he's looking to bounce back. And if there's not going to be anyone in the front court to really stop him, I think that's going to give it a, an opportunity to get back into his efficiency. Yeah, he went nine for 29 last night, one for 12 from three, got 25 points. So I'm expecting him to bounce back if there's not anyone stopping him in the front court because, you know, you're going to have Mitch and Miles Turner uh, battling it out. So I think there will be an opportunity there. So because of that, I'm going to go with a. If those guys are missing, I think it's going to be, I think it'll be like a one. I'm going to go one, 10, 102 affair for the Knicks. If those guys are back, if you're, if the paces are healthy, I expect this to be much tighter. And I'd go like 107, 105 Knicks. That's how it will get it. But with that, Thank you, Mark, for for coming through and helping me preview this game. Please let our listeners know where they can find you and any work that you got out there that's coming up. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. You can find me on Twitter at MG underscore Schindler. Um, I have a feature coming out later today at WMUA.com. I'll have uh, an article on Bryce Hopkins up at Providence coming out pretty soon um, over at Dime Up Rocks and uh, plenty of stuff coming my way. But I really appreciate you having me on, man. This was fun. Absolutely. Thank you for coming through. And Knicks Nation, thank you all for tuning in again. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to share all these videos. Clip them up. Let them, let everybody know about what's going on here. Make sure to check out all these Game of the Week previews. You know, we're just trying to find, we're trying to get the intel of the opposing team, make this an interesting matchup, understand the storylines, break down the game. Make sure to share these videos. Also, make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com where you can catch Remy's recaps after every single game. Thorough recap of what happened. He breaks down every single player that was in there, gives you his thoughts on how Tom Thibodeau did as a coach as well, and gives you his overall thoughts on recapping the game and going into the next one. So make sure to check that out, as well as all the other articles over at KnicksFanTV.com. We'll catch you for post-game after the Knicks play the Indiana Pacers. We out.